morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm Stephanie Skalik. I'm the intern minister here at this congregation. I've been away for a few weeks. It's so awesome to be here and see everybody. I'm offering the reflection today. Some of you might remember, because I think I've shared it here before, that my life has had an abundance of change. We moved a lot when I was a child, especially when I was in elementary school where we often moved um, twice or more per year. When I was moving into the dorms for my freshman year of college, my mom and I sat down and we tallied it up. It had been 26 houses in 20 years, so quite a lot. And sometimes that change was painful. Um, it was a lot of goodbyes, and it was a lot of starting over from scratch socially. So you might think that once I was an adult, when I got to college, um, that I would have held fast to the first stable thing I could find, <laughs> that I would have chosen the sure thing and embraced some stability. You might reasonably expect that I would still be living in Washington, D.C., doing the same job that I picked when in my undergrad. But that's not what happened. <laughs> so there are a few reasons for that, I think. One of the most important ones was that my childhood taught me that home is the people you love, not necessarily a house or a street or a town. It's not a roof. It's not a collection of possessions, though I do have a lot of those, especially books and shoes, and I have dragged them across the ocean a couple of times. For me, home is a way of being in the world and a way of loving. And so far, it's been bigger than any of the changes that could come at me. The other major reason that I didn't stay put when I got to DC was that I still had so much wanderlust left. I had a real longing for far off places and for friends that I hadn't even met yet. I wanted, I, I still want, <laughs> I want to get to know them and to see how they see the world. And I want to find out what knowing them will teach me about myself. So when I went to college, I studied international relations and specifically international development and African studies, and many adventures ensued. <laughs> Successful development work is all about relationships. You have to listen for a long time before you can do any of the work. Because any successful development project has to be what the people themselves want and what the people themselves need. They have to identify that, and then you help them build it. And they have to feel ownership over it for it to be successful, because if you come in and you say, you know what you need, and you build it, nobody's going to use that. It's not going to help anyone. So that's accomplished through prioritizing relationship. I learned new languages. I learned new ways of being in the world. I made some amazing friends, and I learned a lot about power and about economics and about social justice. It was good work. So when I stumbled into a job at Peace Corps headquarters in film and video production, I went into it thinking that it was a foot-in-the-door kind of job. Not precisely what I was looking for, but interesting and with potential to lead to other things. And hey, it was salaried, which was a new and refreshing thing at the time. It was a job where I was producing a series of educational videos for American school children about the countries that Peace Corps served in. So like a day in the life of Cameroon or a day in the life of Kyrgyzstan. I had zero experience in film and video production or curriculum design. 
It was a big change, but I was game to try. And it turned out that I was actually pretty good at it, and in fact, I loved it so much that I switched careers. And I spent the next 15 years uh, working with youth, teaching media literacy, video production, and helping them tell their stories. Many, many adventures ensued. Film is a collaborative medium, and when you're working with youth to support them in telling a story, you have to start with relationship. You need to build trust, you need to listen, so that they can tell the story that they want to tell, that they need to tell, and that they own that story. I taught at after-school programs, summer camps, sometimes private schools, and I learned a new way of seeing the world and my place in it. I made some amazing friends. And actually, I learned a lot about power and economics and social justice. And now here I am in Act Three, underway with another big change in my life. I'm in seminary, I'm an intern minister here at this congregation, and this summer I have been doing a unit of clinical pastoral education at Legacy Emanuel Hospital. If you're unfamiliar with CPE, clinical pastoral education, you could think of it as boot camp for chaplains. It's an adventure, for sure. And I know from the outside that someone might look at my life and think that I'm just bouncing around with seemingly unrelated careers, hoping that something will stick. It might look as if there's just change after change with no through line. But this work, too, is all about relationship. It's about listening and building trust so that you can support people with what they need and what they want. And more than ever in the last two years, both here with you all in this congregation and at the hospital this summer, I feel that I have learned new ways of seeing the world and my place in it. And I have made some amazing friends. And I've learned a lot about power and economics and social justice. My life looks so different today than what it looked like when I was a child or when I first moved into that dorm room. So much has changed. But certain truths about the way we are in the world and the way we are with each other never change. About six weeks ago, I was outside the Boone's Ferry entrance, right over there next to the parking lot. I was sitting in a circle with uh, a group, and Marcia was reading a poem by Schuyler, a longtime member of our community who had passed away. As I was listening to the poem, I looked down at the circle of weeds we were all sitting around, and I noticed that the weeds and moss underneath them was filled with bricks, and on each brick there was something written. And on the brick closest to me, right next to my feet, I could make out the letters S-K-Y-L-A-R. Schuyler's name was there, if only barely legible. I couldn't believe the coincidence. Once the meeting ended, I pointed out to the group what I had discovered under all the grass, and several of us spontaneously knelt down and began pulling on the weeds. We weren't talking, we just wanted to reveal what was under all the gunk. But many of the weeds were deep in the cracks and far too many of them for us, and we eventually stood up and brushed the dirt from our hands. A few days later, Bev Cook, who volunteers to care for the grounds of the church, agreed to show me around. And I began pulling weeds and weed eating, and especially around that circle of bricks. Even after removing the weeds, I could still barely read most of the names. And I came back later with a pressure washer, which led to a very interesting encounter with what I would call a living legacy of our church from over 60 years ago which I will get to because the sermon is about change, not about weed eating and pressure washing. Each brick in the circle has a story behind it, and each story is a part of this church, this community. Each story is like a thread in a tapestry that tells the history of this place. 
Picking out Schuyler's name was like finding a thread, and each brick was another thread. And when you step back, you see from a perspective wider and broader the threads weaving together into a tapestry. Many of the names in the circle of bricks are no longer active in the church. Some have passed away. Others have moved on. But others have joined and are now woven into the history and the story. So the people and their stories start and stop and new ones added in a constant change. But the picture, the tapestry, the church continues. There's an old philosophical story called the ship of Theseus or Theseus's paradox. Theseus being the hero who slayed the Minotaur and he was also the mythical king of Athens. Here's the paradox. If the ship Theseus sailed home on after slaying the Minotaur was preserved for thousands of years by slowly replacing every piece of decaying wood until nothing of the original wood was left, but the boat was still the same shape and could sail, would it still be the ship of Theseus? What is preserved and what is changed? If the individuals who make up UUCWF are all eventually replaced by new members, is it still the same community? Aren't we passing something tangible and intangible that doesn't change for generations? Likewise, if Scott Silver replaces every piece of wood on the roof and the rest of the building, will it still be our church? I call that the Scott Silver paradox. <laughs> Amongst all the turmoil and uncertainty that we experience, all the tremendous upheaval and change that we have endured and no doubt will continue to endure, there are many things that persist and many of them very, very good things. They persist through the upheaval and the chaos of the times. We get our word for thread or suture from sutra. It's an ancient Sanskrit word that can mean sacred thread or code or note as in a song or a chant. You may have heard of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, which is a collection of 196 short verses that serve as a guide to attain wisdom and self-realization through yoga and is regarded by many as the basis of yoga philosophy. And there are many Buddhist sutras as well, like the famous Diamond Sutra. From this point of view, each line of a philosophical text in, Hindu in Hinduism is a sutra, a sacred thread. And these many threads add to make a complete teaching or sacred story. Our history, all of us, this church, our faith, our community is made up of stories threaded together that when taken as a whole may not be on the level of the Diamond Sutra or the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, but is a sacred story nonetheless. So let me get back to the beginning of my story, back to my weed eating, except at this point, I had hooked up my pressure washer and was washing away the grime and the gunk from the bricks when I saw a couple walk up from the parking lot. I switched off the noisy washer and greeted them. A white-haired woman smiled at me and said her name was Anne Batch Elder, and that her father was Reverend Batch Elder here many years ago. She asked me if I had ever heard of him. I told her I was very happy to meet her and that I knew of her father and that we refer to his name often, especially before COVID, when we would announce coffee and conversation after the service in the Batch Elder Room. She gave me a big smile. She said she would, she asked if she could look around and come into the church since she had never seen the new wing. I apologize for not showing her around personally, but my rubber boots with, were dripping with goop and she assured me she would find her way around with her husband. Later, when she had been all through the church, she told me she was thrilled to see the inside again. She said the minister's office used to be a chapel and that the preschool was where she and her family lived for many years. Then she told me about how Lambert, 
a plumber who was repairing the roof and removing one of the towers had fallen off the roof, but fortunately fell on a tree that saved him. However, according to Scott, that story may not be 100% accurate, and some type of foul play may have been involved. So you see, there are many stories that make up this church, some not strictly sacred, perhaps, but that's for another sermon. Anne and her husband stayed and chatted for a while, and I invited them to come back, especially in the fall, when all the services were going in full swing and our minister was back from vacation. Just before she and her husband left, Anne looked at me and said, thank you for taking such good care of the church. Now I know I looked the part that one day I have to be there. I know she didn't mean just me, since it takes a lot of people and when I told her she was welcome, I meant it from all of us. And now I am passing this story on to you. And together we have woven a bit more into the fabric that makes up the tapestry that is this place, past, present, and future, that lives on amidst the onslaught of change. <laughs>